there is nothing worse than wasting your hard-earned money on a system that turns out to be disappointing. And that's true no matter what your budget. I always like to say that all builds are budget builds. Budgets are just different. So today I'm gonna to share with you a few rules for getting the most base for your budget. Rule number one, only pay more if you get more. Take this Boss amplifier here, for example. I've tested this amp on my channel. It's a perfectly fine amplifier. The problem is that it doesn't really offer a really good value. This amplifier here is a lot less expensive and it provides very similar performance. And this Boss amp right here really is the best example of rule number one. You're gonna pay more for the Boss amp and you're not gonna get more performance. So remember, only pay more if you get more. Don't get too hung up on the brand name. 90% of you have got a smartphone in your hand right now. In a quick Google search, you can find out which brands are just making up numbers and which ones actually do have realistic power numbers on the outside of the box. So it's pretty easy to know which brands are worth spending a little bit more money on. Now there are some very important corollaries to that rule. You have to have realistic expectations. The cheapest gear on the market may not be the worst, but it's definitely not the best. And the most expensive gear on the market may not be the best, but it's definitely not the worst. And the most important corollary to rule number one is don't be afraid to spend a little bit more so you can get more. Let's take a look at an example. I tested this amp. I was able to get 500 watts out of it and it's 65 bucks on Amazon. This is one of the best deals out there. But this recoil amp is about a hundred bucks and I was able to squeeze about 700 watts out of this one. If you want more power, you're going to have to pay more to get it. Now these two brands are kind of new players in the marketplace and are mostly unknown. And the problem with brands like that is that you don't know what their long-term reliability is. You don't know what their long-term customer service looks like. If that's important to you, you're going to have to spend more to get that. Looking at a brand like Kicker, for example. Take a look at this subwoofer enclosure. This is a Goldwood 12 inch ported subwoofer box. I picked it up from Parts Express for about 70 bucks. I picked this thing up for two reasons. The first reason reason is I know you are always looking for budget gems. So when I see something with potential, I try to pick it up and review it. And two, this enclosure has something a little bit special. Most of your less expensive subwoofer enclosures that are down in this price point are made out of 5 8 inch MDF which in my opinion is far too thin for a subwoofer enclosure unless you're just running a really weak low powered subwoofer. And let's be honest, where's the fun in that? I found one of those boxes on Amazon last year and I tested it out. It was exactly what I expected. That box right now is about 60 bucks on Amazon. I would recommend that you spend more to get more, pay 10 extra dollars in order to get the box with a little thicker material. In fact, when I was doing some market research for the video, I found some 5 8 MDF boxes on Amazon for as much as 80 bucks. That's paying more to get less. You don't want to do that. But no matter what you end up buying, the corollary still applies. The cheapest thing out there might not be the worst, but it's definitely not the best. All of these less expensive subwoofer enclosures have the same exact problems. They tend to be far too small and they tend to be tuned far too high. That is not just my opinion. There's this thing called Hoffman's Iron Law. It's a matter of physics. Subwoofers are gonna give you more output and more low end extension in a bigger box. I pulled out my DATS and I did a sweep of this enclosure. We do this in order to figure out what the tuning frequency is. It's tuned to about 40 Hertz, which is a little bit on the high side. The end result is you're going to get a peaky or a boomy sound. There's going to be a big boost around 50 to 60 hertz, and then it's going to trail off rapidly and you're not going to get any of that really low bass. If you're looking for a sound quality system, you want a system with more low end extension. So an enclosure like this isn't going to work for you. But this is the only subwoofer enclosure in that price range that uses the three quarter inch material. So this is definitely the one to get. Now that lack of low end extension is gonna be a problem if you like that really bass heavy stuff, the tracks from Techmaster PEB and Bass Mechanic or Bass 305, or if you're into like trap music or EDM, you definitely want more low end extension for that kind of music. So I guess another rule we can throw in there is that you need to understand your taste in music. If you like 80s rock and roll, for example, this is gonna be perfect. In fact, if you were to go to a music store and pick up a bass cabinet for your bass guitar, it's probably tuned to around 40 Hertz. 
Rule number three, you can stretch your budget by doing better planning, better researching, and making sure that you match your gear. I wanna thank my patrons with a special shout out to Dylan, Bo, and Baba. If you enjoy this kind of content, you can check out the link down in the description. Head over to Patreon and support DIY audio content. When I test out enclosures, I like to use this subwoofer right here. This is a Kicker Comp R12. If I use the same subwoofer for every test, then the results will be consistent. So I loaded this thing into the truck for a listening impression and the results were underwhelming. <sighs> Why? Two reasons. First of all, this enclosure is not a good match for this subwoofer. Last year, I built a custom enclosure for this subwoofer and in that box, this $150 subwoofer punches above its weight. That box is 2.5 cubic feet. It's tuned to 34 Hertz. This subwoofer here is not going to reach its full potential inside of this enclosure. Now, some subwoofers perform well in smaller enclosures. What I recommend is starting off with the subwoofer and then finding or building an enclosure so that that subwoofer performs at its best. The only time you want to start with the enclosure is when you're really limited on space, like an enclosure under the back seat in a pickup truck. Oh, hey, check this out. Everyone loves to see the subwoofer flex. Isn't that cool how much it moves? No, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> That's not cool at all. The only reason why it's moving this much is because I'm playing below the tuning frequency. If I could throw the full 500 watts to this sub in this box, the darn thing would probably bottom out. Bottoming out, that's what you call it when the voice call collides with the back plate. Hey, hey, wait a second. I know for a fact this amplifier can give us a full 500 watts. Why am I not getting the full 500 watts here in this situation? That is the second reason why this combination is so underwhelming. This subwoofer is a dual four ohm subwoofer. For those who are new to this, what that means in practical terms is that if you look on the back of the subwoofer, there's gonna be two connections for speaker wire. If you wire those two connections in parallel, just run the positive to the positive and the negative to the negative, the subwoofer will present a two ohm load to the amplifier. Well, this amp does its peak power at one ohm. Generally, as the ohms get lower, the amplifier can deliver more power. In a best case scenario, this amplifier can only give us about 350 watts into a two ohm load. And you can think of that 350 watt number as like an experimental in a laboratory under ideal conditions number. The reality is it's gonna give you a whole lot less power when you're actually playing it on an actual subwoofer. In fact, I hooked up my AMM1 while playing it. The most power that I saw at any moment was 210 watts. Not because of something wrong with the subwoofer, not because of something wrong with the amplifier, because the subwoofer and the amplifier were just simply mismatched. And that is bad no matter what your budget. How do we fix that? That's easy. Kicker sells a dual two ohm version of this subwoofer. So when we go to pick out our equipment, we buy that version of this subwoofer. Those dual two ohm voice coils can then be wired in parallel to one ohm. Now the amplifier is gonna give us plenty of power. What do you do if you've already got the subwoofer on hand? Well, maybe you wanna consider sending the subwoofer back or just going ahead and selling it and picking up a different one. Because in order to get the full 500 watts into a two ohm load, you're gonna to have to spend more money. You could, for example, pick up this JP8 from Down for Sound. It's around 200 bucks right now. It will definitely give you 500 watts into that two ohm load. And if you want to upgrade later and add a second subwoofer, it can be wired to one ohm and you can get more juice out of this amplifier. This is definitely a pay more to get more situation. This amp has the best bass knob in the business. It looks fantastic, has that cool acrylic back plate on it. So it's a great solid amplifier. It's a lot more expensive than this thing, but it's also a much better amplifier. Another option is this Kenwood amplifier. Uh, this is a 1000 watt into a two ohm load amplifier. I personally run this amplifier and think it's a great amp. So what you would do is something like this is get this larger amplifier and then turn the gain down so you're only giving the subwoofer for 500 watts. The problem with that is you're gonna be paying for power that you're not using. But all that's a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated than just planning ahead and making sure your equipment works well together. Which brings us to the corollary to rule number two. No matter what your budget, you might be able to get some better performance or save some money by shifting that budget around. Consider running a 10 instead of a 12, especially if your amplifier can't push that 12 to its full potential. Use the money you save to get a slightly better box for that 10, because a 10 in the right box might be able to outperform a 12 in the wrong box. 
And you know what seems off balance to me? Using a $150 subwoofer inside of a $70 box and driving it with a $65 amplifier. Sure, you've got a system for under 300 bucks. You'd be better off to drop down to an $80 subwoofer and then use the savings to invest in a better enclosure and the proper power wire. I could do an entire video on picking out the right size power wire. In fact, I've done just that. Click right here to see that video. I'm Justin, also known as the DIY Audio Guy, and I will see you on the next adventure.